Good evening, my friends. This is the Grim Flayer, and I hope you're doing very well tonight. We are here to discuss some spoilers that, frankly, I had no idea were coming. The Command Cycle from Strixhaven, which is the next standard set that's coming, but still pretty far in the distance. However, these five cards were spoiled on stream. Of course, the channel being what it is, we are focusing on the Black Ones, Witherbloom Command, the Golgari Command, and Silverquill Command, the Orzov Command. And uh, I've got a quote Nostier from my Discord, who I believe was the first one to react to these, and he said, WTF, can't we go two hours without new products? So true. My exhaustion is complete, my friends. I've been recording a ton of content lately. In case you haven't noticed, I've recorded the pregame show for our Battle for the Goifs tournament. That'll be out in a couple days, but just when I thought I could maybe get an hour to relax, boom these commands drop, and you know, I had to do it. I had to cover them, so here we are. Gonna take a look at them. I have not had a chance to really gather my thoughts. This is going to be a hot take, if you will, my first reaction to these. Thank you for watching, and let's get into it. We got some modal spells entering BGX and Modern. So we have to start, as you knew I would, with the Golgari one, Witherbloom Command. A CMC2 Golgari Sorcery, or is it CMC? Well, if you look at the text, if we jump ahead, it says Mana Value. What on earth is Mana Value, or, or Mana Value, maybe, for the people who hate the way I say the word? Um, apparently, this phrase is replacing converted Mana Cost, and yes, it is shorter. It is less clunky. Maybe it is... I, I, I don't know if it's more intuitive or not, but it's new and it's different, and I'm a mid-range boomer, and I don't like change. Converted mana cost is such a iconic phrase for magic, in my opinion, so I am against this change, if that's indeed what it is, which it seems to be. But anyway, let's talk about the actual card and not the semantic angle quite yet. So Witherbloom Command, one black, one green sorcery, as we say, and it's choose two. Now, stop right there. It's a two mana two for one. That's what it is, that is the floor of the card, and that's how we should evaluate it. So there are problems with some of these modes, it's not always going to line up how we want, but it is a 2 mana 2 for 1, and it is modal. Collective Brutality is the obvious comparison, we'll compare it in depth, but just to kick things off, Brutality is not a 2 for 1. Brutality is a flexible 1 for 1, or a 2 for 2, or a 3 for 3, so it gets you tempo but it does not directly trade 2 for 1 or 3 for 1. It lets you trade at resource parity in a way that accrues tempo and or is flexible. Witherbloom Command is different because it is a genuine 2 for 1. It is genuine card advantage most of the time anyway. Doesn't mean it's straight up strictly better than Brutality or anything like that, but I just want everybody to understand that as we read the modes. There are four modes from which to choose. First one, target player mills three cards. Then you return a land card from your graveyard to your hand. Second mode, destroy target non-creature, non-land permanent with mana value, two or less. Third mode, target creature gets minus three, minus one until end of turn. Fourth mode, target opponent loses two life and you gain two life. So the last mode first, that is just like it is on Collective Brutality. Before moving on, I wanted to pull up Brutality for comparison, as you can see the last line there, and the last line here, the same exact thing, and one other similarity is Brutality, uh, in order to achieve that 2 for 2 or 3 for 3 trade that I talked about, of course you escalate, we all know this, Escalate is synergistic, so even though you trade 2 for 2 or 3 for 3, again, it's not directly resource advantageous, you do get tempo out of it, our deck needs that badly at times, and you do benefit broadly from having cards in the graveyard, you know? It's not as good as having a card in hand most of the time, but it gets you some type of value. But going back to Witherbloom Command, this self-mill mode, you can mill the opponent too sometimes, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but the self-mill mode is kind of um, another way in which there's a great deal of overlap 
right, with collective brutality because you are self-milling, and that's kind of like Escalate in that it is broadly useful for you to have a full graveyard when you're playing a normal rock game under most circumstances, right? And uh, so let's talk about that first mode. Target player mills three cards, then you return a land card from your graveyard to your hand. So this is kind of the pseudo-cantrip nature of the card. We are not Jund. We could evaluate this for Jund, but I am doing so for rock. Um, at least, at least for now. We are not Jund, so we do not have the ability to pick lands back up out of our graveyard every turn like Renin 6 does. This is definitely very powerful. That is one of the main reasons why Renin 6 is a staple in Jund. On BGX, we don't have card selection, so making your land drops is huge. In whatever your rock build, it is important. We play so many monosyncs, and whether it's Lurus Rock, and you can double spell with some cheap stuff, or whether it's Boomer Rock and you're trying to go big and play four drops. In either case, you have creature lands, you have monosyncs as far as your creatures go. The list goes on. It is really nice to just get an extra card while you're doing other things. And specifically, if nurturing peat lands are in your deck, then this can be considered almost a cantrip, right? Definitely not as good as one, but almost as good as one. And another thing to mention before we talk about other things is the casting cost of Witherbloom Command is definitely a little bit tough. Anybody who's played my namesake card, Grim Flare, before knows that a black and a green on turn two, those are some relatively specific mana costs. So, um, what we need to think about here is, let's say for the sake of argument, this card does rock. The prospect of Field of Ruin or Ghost Quarter, your colorless utility lands, their stock is a little bit lowered insofar as being able to cast this on curve is concerned. And maybe a third nurturing peatland becomes a consideration to maybe replace one of the brown lands, right? Because not only can it cast this card, but in the late game, you can buy back a cracked peat land with this card. And that's kind of like one turn of a Renin 6 loop with that, right? Um, on the other hand, a great use case of Wither Bloom Command is to buy back a Ghost Quarter or a Field of Ruin that you've already used to great effect against the opponent. So as you can see, we are only on the first line, and there is a lot to take in here, which is why the, the first few takes I've heard, I've heard a couple people say this card is awesome, and many other people say it's not good at all. I gotta, I gotta reject the not good at all. There's a ton going on here. This card's got a lot to like. Again, it's a two mana two for one, and it's got four different modes. We can't dismiss it, right? And um, yeah, so lots to explore there. The final thing I'll say about this first point is that, of course, you can mill the opponent. And against a combo deck with limited win conditions, if you're desperate, maybe you can mill them and hope to uh, luck a mill... Um, Luckily, mill a win condition into the graveyard where they can no longer tutor for it, for example. Um, more realistically, it's a way to mess up people's scries, mess up their top deck. And um, also, most of the time, I imagine you will be milling yourself, maybe trying to find a better land to buy back, even if you already have one, and further diversify your graveyard. But, you know, even against an opponent that you haven't managed to put much in the graveyard, you can potentially mill them and grow goifs this way. So there's a lot going on there. And then the whole notion of the floor of that first mode is, of course, your plus one card. It's a land, but you're still plus one card. The second bullet point, destroy target non-creature, non-land permanent with mana value, two or less. I think I'm saying mana, mana differently every single time. Forgive me. Um, destroy target non-creature, non-land permanent. Two or less. So this is a little limited, right? It's definitely a little limited in scope, but you can think of many, many things that it will hit. A Chalice of the Void on one, or on zero for that matter, which is not going to happen here. We have Rest in Peace, we have Ether Vial, lots and lots of things that come up. That said, it is a little bit limited. Obviously, it can't hit creatures. That's a bit rough. And a lot of the things that Abrupt Decay can take care of, this cannot. The first thing that comes to my mind is Ensnaring Bridge. The second thing that comes to my mind is Blood Moon. Might be a little tough to cast this under Moon anyway, but you guys get the point. So um, the other disadvantage this has over a card like Decay, of course, Sorcery Speed, making it even worse against Blood Moon exactly. But you guys get the point. 
If that second bullet point is well positioned, though, if there's lots of cards in the meta that that can hit, then I think this card is going to be really good because you get to outright destroy something and self mill and buy back a land. That's really good, and that's only if the first two modes line up, right? So um, this is maybe the highest ceiling, lowest floor mode, I would say, the second bullet point, right? Um, the third bullet point is interesting. Target creature gets minus three, minus one until end of turn. So, of course, the dream would be, like, against an Aether Vile deck, especially if they're stuck on a one-lander and they're having to, like really play through Vile, and they also have played an X1. You get to beat up on the X1, you get to kill the X1, destroy the Vile. There are going to be some blowouts with this card for only two mana, make no mistake. Um, broadly speaking, though, one thing I'll say to, to kind of dampen enthusiasm maybe about this is we don't need that much more X1 hate. We've got Plague Engineer, we've got Liliana the Last Hope. We also, of course, have the card where you can most directly compare this to Collective Brutality that not only kills the X1s, it kills X2s too. And, and trust me, that is a big difference. It is a big deal. On the other hand, Wither Bloom Command, if it is broadly well positioned enough, it can combo uh, with even with Brutality, if you're playing both, Stranger Things Have Happened, or with the aforementioned Last Hope and Plague Man, to kill things higher than it is perhaps intended to be. This is also a combat trick, you know. You can do the classic attack with the Goyf, um, you know, maybe a 3-4 butting heads with an opposing 3-4. Uh, that's maybe most likely in a Goyf mirror, in a PGX mirror. And then post-combat, you can kill it, right? Or pre-combat, you can shrink something to make your attack safe. You know, there's a lot going on here, even if you don't outright get kills. But that's all a little cute. The... Um, the stock of this card will to some degree depend on how many kills you can actually get with this. Because again, if it's a 2 mana 2 for 1, you're doing great. Um, an outright kill plus pick a land back up, that is great in our deck for 2 mana. Finally, target opponent loses 2 life and you gain 2 life. Obviously, we all know from Collective Brutality, this is really, really great. However, let's be clear, Wither Bloom Command, not anywhere near as good against Burn because it's not killing any of the Burn threats unless they maybe have a 1 of Grim Lava Mancer, right? But Collective Brutality obviously could kill that too. Maybe you could answer a Rest in Peace, and that's cute, out of Burn, right? That's not nothing. Um, but, you know, and, and buying back like a cracked fetch land or a cracked peat land, this is not even especially desirable most of the time against burn. So Wither Bloom Command. There's more to say about it, but we could speculate endlessly because of the permutations of what what is in the meta and what it synergizes with in the various scenarios go on and on and on. I hope I've given you enough fruit, food for thought. I do not think this necessarily even competes with Collective Brutality. I don't think it's as good right? But here's the interesting thing. So I have felt like a lot of people seem to either load up on brutalities or cut them all together. And they, maybe they seem to go back and forth based on exactly how well they think this card is positioned in the meta. I myself, in the list that I'm building, am almost always on either one or two brutality. Even if I don't think brutality is that good, I kind of want one because you can leverage exactly one before it starts reaching diminishing returns in all the matchups that it's good in. One against control is good. One against small creature decks is good. Against a deck like Burn, you want as many as you have, right? But obviously, Burn is not always what we can afford to heavily tech against. So my point here, though, is that some people, again, they're all or nothing with brutality. I don't agree with that. I don't really think that's correct. And other people might naturally assume, and I, I, I understand why, that Wither Bloom Command might compete with collective brutality. I don't think it necessarily does. So if you're like me and you're thinking brutality is kind of a one to two of based on the meta in your deck, Witherbloom Command can actually be a nice companion to collective brutality in a few different ways. Your, <laughs> your um, permutations of, of your possible early turn plays just go exponentially through the roof. And even interestingly, you know, you can escalate lands away with brutality and then pick them back up with Witherbloom Command. I, I, and I don't think that's too cute to mention, you know? So these cards cover um, some similar ground, but ultimately the Venn diagram, the overlapping part of them might be smaller than it looks at first. But either way, this card is mega, mega interesting. I didn't really expect a Golgari command, frankly, to be this cheap. And a choose to 
and with four different modes. So all of those factors alone mean this one should be well considered before we dismiss it. Put it in your maybe board. I personally, right now, plan to test it. You guys, of course, let me know what you think in the comments below, and let's take a look at the Orzov command. The Orzov command, my friends, is called Silver Quill Command. It is a four drop at the opposite end of the modern playable spectrum, I would say. Um, you know, there is a five drop command in the set that's probably not modern playable. Silver Quill Command up there at the very top of what you'd want to be doing, and we are going to consider this specifically in the context of Dead Guy Ale. Much like you could have considered the Golgari command in the context of Jund, I found it more interesting to do so from the Rock perspective. I think that's also true here. You could consider it for Absin and, and let me know what you think about that, but we're really focusing on Dead Guy here, and I'll tell you why as we get through it. So it's two gray mana, one white, one black for a four mana value sorcery, right? Oh, that's gonna, I'm still gonna say converted mana cost for the rest of my life. Anyway, this is another choose two. And as you would expect from a four drop relative to a two drop, the modes are more powerful than the ones in Wither Bloom. We've got the following. Target creature gets plus three, plus three and gains flying until end of turn. Return target creature card with mana value two or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. Target player draws a card and loses one life. Target opponent sacrifices a creature. So, all of these modes right along the plan with what Dead Guy does. Let's talk about the third mode first, because like the pick up a land mode in Witherbloom, this is the floor of the card. You're drawing a card and you're losing a life. And in, unless you're against burn and that puts you to three or maybe to four, or unless you're at literal one life, this is always live. It is the floor of the card. <laughs> maybe against mill with, you know, two cards left in your deck, whatever, you guys get it. Corner cases aside, this is the floor of the card. It cantrips, right? It cantrips. Or you could be cute and uh, finish your opponent off if they are at exactly one life as well. Do not forget that. That is certainly live, uh, kind of like sign in blood is, right? But the um, other mode that we'll talk about before, you know, that doesn't need any more explanation, right? And the other mode that's really simple to understand is the fourth one. Target opponent sacrifices a creature. This is a Liliana of the Veil edict, and of course, in the context of Dead Guy, that is right along the planet is exactly what we are trying to do, and that's a very easily conceived two of that is a blowout in an interactive match when things are pretty close, you know? Maybe you've got a Lily active, maybe you don't, whatever, you're trading one for one, trying to get a few two for ones in here, and the opponent's got one threat left, and boom, they edict it, you draw a card, this is how we pull ahead, right? This is how we pull ahead, this is what mid-range decks are designed to do, specifically black-based mid-range decks, so that's pretty good. And uh, yeah, I know it's a four drop, I know it's a four drop, the four drops have to be good, but that's pretty good, right? And then there's two other modes to choose from. Return, we'll, we'll talk about the second one. I guess we're working our way from the bottom up here, basically. Uh, return target creature card with mana value two or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. Now, the big reason Dead Guy Ale immediately came to my mind is this deck lives and dies on its two drops. Look at this. We got Stoneforge Mystic buying her back. She is a removal magnet, especially if you, if you kind of know that you want her to be a removal magnet. You can tutor up Batter Skull. They're gonna point their lightning bolt or whatever at her so she doesn't cheat it in. And then you can set up a turn four, buy her back, tutor something else up. The advantage is huge. She's a two for one. The command is a two for one. You're two for one in your opponent for days. Um, Dark Confidant. Dark Confidant is very, very nice when unchecked. Obviously, this guy can snowball games and Tide Hollow Sculler. Similarly, a two for one against the opponent until such time is they're able to remove him. What do you see in common with all of these cards? Well, they're all two drops. They're all in color, uh, in, in the color pairing, and they all die to a stiff breeze. In other words, they're all prime buyback targets. At the same time, a card like Unearth feels a little bit like it's not being maxed out in Dead Guy Ale, right? Because Unearth can go all the way up to CMC3, and it also doesn't do anything else for you when you unearth something. You either cycle it or you unearth it, you pick one. And Unearth is a wonderful card, but again, doesn't feel perfectly suited to Dead Guy Ale. Silver Quill Command, regardless of ultimately whether it will 
make the cut for modern or not, it does feel perfectly suited to Dead Guy Ale for all of those reasons I just mentioned. Now, the new addition is Skyclave Apparition. Obviously, it misses out on that. It'd be really nice to be able to bad buyback Skyclaves, too. But that would change everything about this card. If it was basically in Unearth on top of everything else, that might be a little much. Or, or maybe if this card falls a little bit short, that's what it would have needed to achieve the threshold of modern playability. I'm, as you can see, remaining a little bit agnostic on it, but based on all the things I've mentioned, I think it's at least very fine to test. And the final mode, the first mode that we'll talk about here, is uh, Target Creature gets plus three, plus three, and gains flying until end of turn. That's really nice for the reasons that I just mentioned. All of these premier two-drop threats are small, and they're ground-bound. They're earth-bound. They are along the ground. They do not fly. So that's a good way to get damage over the line. This is in keeping with some white cards. You know, we've seen effects like this out of Elspeth Planeswalkers and stuff like that. These effects are pretty good in Dead Guy Ale, and especially if something is equipped with a sword, that is a way to not only have a huge chunk of damage taken out of your opponent's life total, but to get a sword proc to connect with that sword of Feast and Famine or connect with that sword of Fire and Ice and snowball the game even harder than you already were. Not to make that sound like a win more, because again, you know, you can get ahead and the board can stall after you've got some damage through. This can help you get over the line that way as well. So Silver Quill Command with a lot to like, and, and you could definitely consider it for Absin 2 if you are playing Tarmogoyfs and Scavenging Uses alongside some of the other cards we mentioned. This card buys those back too. The 4-drop slot in Dead Guy is typically sparsely populated, and I think that's for a relatively good reason, um, but this card, I think, could compete with what does C play there. You're talking about maybe Gideon, Ally of Zendikar, or the Escaping Elspeth, the newish 4-mono one. This card is more aggressive. This card is also more directly on plan. Um, it, it's more aggressive in depletion, right? Um, if you if you look at a card like Gideon, Ally of Zendikar, it's just broadly along the plan because it is value positive, right? In other ways, and it has some synergy with Lingering Souls and all that if you plan to make the, um, the Anthem, right? But beyond that, this card is more synergistic. Again, we're cantripping, even though we have to lose a life. We're edicting the opponent. That is huge. We are unearthing Tide Hollow Sculler, Dark Confidant, or Stoneforge Mystic, and we are giving our things Evasion and Giant Growth until end of turn. So, the card is pretty strong, I think. Whether it will be quite strong enough to sneak into modern lists, I don't know, but I think Dead Guy is a very obvious candidate to at least give it a shot. All right, my friends, now I can rest at least momentarily. My work here is done for a little while. They spring these spoilers on me, and I have no choice. I have to stop what I'm doing. I have to pull myself together, go to my computer, and record a Will It Rock video just for you. So I hope you liked it. Obviously, I'm shooting from the hip here. I'm trying to get this out as quickly as possible, because I'm not going to have time to do it over the next couple days, and also because strike while the iron is hot, right? But obviously, there are more things we could cover. I'm mindful of keeping the video shorter, and I think, as I said, I've given you enough food for thought here. So leave your hot takes in the comments below. Wither Bloom Command, Will It Rock, Silver Quill Command, Will It Dead guy you guys will let me know thank you as always for watching and when this set eventually comes out which i hope isn't for a few months yet um we will definitely test one or both of these cards right here on the channel talk to you soon hope everybody out there has a wonderful day